All right. So we move now to item four. I'm going to skip two and three, which we'll we'll tackle after we hear from our guests. And we're joined by Andrew London, Rosie Offord, to talk about the Master Development Plan consultation and the third runway project. And I'd like to welcome you both and perhaps just quickly introduce you with a, some brief bios that I have here. I'll, I'll start with um, Rosie. Rosie Offord is a transportation professional with nearly 20 years experience in airports, infrastructure and management consultancy. She's currently head of master planning at Melbourne Airport, responsible for the long-term planning of the airport estate and delivering planning approvals for major airport projects, including the $1.9 billion third runway project. And Rosie holds a Bachelor of Engineering telecommunications degree with honours. Welcome, Rosie. Andrew Lund spent 18 years working as a journalist in television newsrooms before joining Melbourne Airport in August last year as head of communications and engagement. You, you probably recognise Andrew from his, his work on the television as a political reporter. He's, he's also a has covered transport and now works for the airport. Welcome, Andrew. And I'd, I'll, I'll hand over to you to, to, to take it away. I've, I've enabled sharing. So if you've got anything you'd like to screen share, then, then be sure to go ahead and do that now. Nice, that's come up. Just unmute myself. So can you hear me all? And and as you confirmed, thank you. Um, you can you can see what I've just shared. Yeah, we, we've got you loud and clear. Um, but perhaps you could uh, make it full screen. Yeah. I'm yeah. Just cool. about to do that. Well, it's good. Like an, an old Melways or something. Yeah. Yes. So the story begins um, back in time. So first of all, thank you, thank you for the introductions, and thank you very much for having us here tonight. So I'm going to provide you all with an overview of the two documents that we have out on public exhibition at the moment. One is our preliminary draft master plan 2022, and the other is our preliminary draft third runway major development plan. So uh, both documents are out at the same time. They're called preliminary drafts because that's the stage in the approvals process we are at. Um, and I'll talk a bit more about them in a minute and what's in them. But for now, I want us to cast our minds uh, our minds back. You you picked it, Jonathan. This is a this is an old Melways map from 1970. So Melbourne Airport is 52 years old. Somewhat poignantly, we celebrated our 50th birthday um, on the same day that all international flights stopped in March 2020. Um, so 50 years ago, or, or longer, if you consider the amount of time that it was planned for, the planners, the original planners of Melbourne Airport um, had a vision, and that vision was a fantastic vision, actually. Uh, they, did, they did an extraordinary job. So Melbourne Airport was planned for, to open with two runways. So you can see those two runways on the screen there. Um, I don't know whether you can see my mouse, but that's the existing north-south runway, and that's the existing east-west runway. <clears throat> At the time, the planners envisaged that, Mel envisaged that Melbourne Airport would need four runways. Originally, the third runway, or the second east-west runway was down here, and the second north-south runway all the way down there, closer to the Tullamarine, along the Tullamarine Freeway. Fast forward to 1990, where there was um, a significant planning review and the four runways remained in the plan, but they shifted. And this hashtag orientation, we call it, so parallel north-south runways, parallel east-west runways, sorry, you can't really see my hands, but combined to form a hashtag, is what remains in the plan today. So it's been in the plan since 1990. So we have the existing north-south, the existing east-west, um, the second east-west proposed runway moving a little north, and the second north-south runway moving both to the west and to the north, further away from Essendon Airport. I understand originally it was planned that Essendon Airport would close when it became apparent that it would not. Um, and there was also residential development coming in um, towards Tullamarine. So they shifted that north-south runway from where it was up to where it is today. So the original planners had a great vision and we've stuck to that vision and we continue to safeguard for that vision. And so what we're planning to build, um, what we're proposing to build for our third runway is this second parallel north-south runway here. Uh, 
I'm going to cut to the master plan now um, and just talk really briefly about sort of, you know, the major headlines in the master plan before, before I cover off the third runway in a bit more detail because I presume that's, that's what everyone's here to hear about today. So the master plan includes a whole heap. The master plan is a, it's an Airports Act requirement. So the Melbourne Airport is on federal land. We are governed by the Airports Act and our regulators are up in Canberra, the Department of Infrastructure. Uh, the Airports Act requires that we update our master plan every five years, and that master plan includes the 20-year plan for the airport estate. So what I'm showing here are our development concept plan, both for 2042, so in other words, 20 years, the 20-year horizon of the master plan, and we also include an ultimate um, airport layout in our, in our plan as well. So 20 years from now, you will see the third runway, we have constructed it, that's our vision. Um, you will see here Melbourne Airport Rail coming in from the southeast and depositing pass you know a much a much needed additional piece of tra public transport into the airport. And also we've um, the presence of the third runway here will enable some aviation or non-aviation development in what we're calling the western sub precinct, so over to the west of the airport. The long-term concept plan I've included here because I just want to reiterate that we continue to safeguard for that four runway hashtag, um, sorry, phone's ringing, for that four runway ultimate layout hashtag, run, hashtag that, that the plan is set out in 1970 and refined in 1990. So where are we at in the process? And this is, this is really important. Um, we're on public exhibition. We are at the very beginning of the process in terms of building and opening the third runway on, the, on Melbourne Airport. So as I said, there are two documents available on public exhibition at the moment. They're called preliminary drafts because that is the stage in the approvals process that they are at. They are not yet approved. So the Airports Act requires that we go out on exhibition with the preliminary draft master plan and the preliminary draft um, of any major development plan, but in this case, the third runway. The reason why they're both out at the same time, our current master plan is our 2018 master plan, and it has us building our third runway in the east-west orientation. In 2019, we had a review of those plans, and we changed our preferred orientation of the third runway to north-south, and I'm happy to talk about that a bit later if, if anyone wishes, but fundamentally, our plans changed, the airline supported that change, the air traffic controllers supported that change. So what we need to do now is update our master plan to reflect the order in which we want to develop those runways because that's changed. And also we need the master plan approved and also we, wanted, we want the third runway project approved. And because really one of the key themes in the master plan is that change in orientation, it makes sense for us and, and um, our regulators agreed that we go on public exhibition with both documents at the same time. And we have extended the public exhibition to reflect um, both the amount of information available on ex exhibition, but also um, the level of interest that the community will have, which we appreciate um, in our plans to develop the third runway. So public exhibition, um, will conclude in the middle of May. It's been running since the 1st of February. After public exhibition, we finalise the master plan and we finalise the major development plan. So we ready them, in other words, to submit to the minister. What we have, this is really important. What we have to include in our submission to minister is not just the draft document, but it's also something called the supplementary report. And the supplementary report includes all the comments we've received and also has to talk about how we've dealt with them or how we've responded to them. So this is, this is really important. It's not just the project, its impacts and its benefits that we're having approved or the minister takes into account when approving. So currently the Minister for Infrastructure is Barnaby Joyce, as you know, who knows after May, but right now um, it's, it's, it's Minister Joyce. So he will look at both the plans for the project, its impacts and benefits, but also the response from the community and from our major stakeholders and how we have dealt with that response, right? So master plan will go up um, for minister approval in early September, assuming all goes to plan. That will be approved um, in December this year. And then as soon as the master plan's approved, we put the major development plan for the third runway up to the minister for approval on that and hope to receive approval for that, if, again, if all goes to plan in March 2023, so March next year. 
just because we so approval doesn't mean it opens immediately we can't put a spade in the ground until we've received that approval so what we're doing now is progressing through design detailed design we're looking at how we'll deliver the project we then have to construct it we have to go through a complicated process called airspace change um, because a new runway means new flight paths and the whole Melbourne airspace um, should be reviewed as you know by air services as part of that we have to go through something called ORAT, which is Operational Readiness Acceptance Testing, which is a long process for such an important piece of infrastructure like a new runway in terms of making sure everyone's okay with how it will be used and how it will be operated before we open it officially. Um, the earliest possible time that we could open it is 2027. But in reality, don't quote me on this, but in reality, because of the complicated nature of this project, the number of stakeholders, everything we have to get through in terms of design, development, field, um, the more likely opening year is probably 2029. I, I think that's, that's my take on it anyway. I'm going to play video. Melbourne Airport is Victoria's yeah. main gateway for international and domestic passengers and for time critical freight. To help keep the state's growing population and economy connected, Melbourne Airport needs to grow. As part of that, we're planning to build a third runway, parallel to the existing North-South runway. Located 1.3 kilometres to the west, the new 3,000 metre long runway will be connected to the airport's terminals by a network of new taxiways. The design of this critical piece of infrastructure will allow for simultaneous arrivals and departures on the parallel runways, which will significantly increase the airport's capacity and reduce the duration and impact of delays. The north-south orientation for Melbourne's new runway has been chosen to maximise its availability based on prevailing wind conditions. The $1.9 billion project will help cater for the long-term growth of Melbourne Airport's passenger and freight task and support thousands of new jobs. At its southern end, Melbourne's new runway will include a 200-metre starter extension to give heavy aircraft departing on hot days enough length to take off on the uphill slope. The planned runway features rapid exit taxiways for each landing direction as well as intersection departure taxiways to provide pilots and air traffic controllers with maximum flexibility. Construction of the new runway will require a shortening of the existing east-west runway to account for a difference in terrain height. In designing the new runway layout, Melbourne Airport has attempted to retain as much of the grey box woodland at the north of the airfield as possible. When it opens, the new north-south parallel runway system will become the airport's primary operating configuration and will require changes to existing flight paths. This will result in changes to the areas affected by aircraft noise. Where practical, noise impacts will be distributed over green wedges and undeveloped regions to the airport's north. And while the impact in some areas will be reduced, other areas will experience more aircraft flying overhead. The project also includes new roads and a new security checkpoint to provide access into the midfield area, including the control tower, with works to minimise impact on the nearby Melbourne Airport golf course. The roads will travel underneath the new twin taxiways, which will be spaced far enough apart to allow the largest wide-body aircraft to travel in each direction independently. The road underpass structure will run for approximately 300 metres below the taxiways, providing improved access for airfield vehicles and emergency services. Construction is expected to take four to five years and will create hundreds of new jobs with a focus on local recruitment. Once operational, the new runway will help support thousands more jobs, providing a direct benefit to nearby communities while injecting billions of dollars into the wider state economy. Melbourne Airport has a sustainable procurement policy and will use circular economy principles to ensure that recycled material is used in construction where possible. Environmental considerations are a key priority. Arundel Creek will be channelled via culvert under the taxiways before emerging back onto its original course. 
Melbourne Airport is working to a reference opening year of 2026, but this is subject to the industry's ongoing recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. Melbourne Airport welcomes community feedback as it strives to meet Victoria's needs now and into the future. To find out more and to have your say, visit www.melbourneairport.com.au forward slash runway. Once is enough, I think. Um, now, so huge generational change project for Melbourne Airport and for Melbourne and for Victoria. Why are we doing this? Why do we need to do this now? So um, this is about meeting our forecast demand. We have an obligation under the Airports Act to meet our forecast demand. And um, this is about on-time performance as well. So looking back, 2019 was our last year of full activity, although it's looking like Easter might actually overtake that again, which is kind of extraordinary, um, given what we've been through over the past two years. 2019, last full year of activity. So what happened on a normal weekday, on the, as far as the domestic network goes, 60% of the domestic aircraft in Australia will touch Melbourne Airport before lunchtime. So Melbourne Airport, with its two runway operation, was starting, especially in the peak, was starting to cause delays and those delays weren't just impacting operations at Melbourne Airport. Because of the way the domestic network works, if Melbourne Airport gets sick, the rest of the ne domestic network catches a cold as well. So in other words, delays at Melbourne Airport were affecting the entire eastern seaboard, especially, you know, Sydney and Brisbane, you know, the, 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 the key capital networks that, we're, that people use so much. Now, COVID, you can't have any presentation without mentioning it. COVID was huge for all of us and it was huge for the airport. You know, we had, we had months and, and times, even, even as soon as, as recent as last year, where we were down to 1% of our normal activity of 100,000 passengers per day. So there, it, it, the airport resembled a ghost town. But it has been extraordinary to witness the rebound over the past few months. I mean, we saw a rebound happen every time we opened up and then we shut down again and so on and so forth. But, I mean, really over the past few months, um, We've been consistently seeing 70 to 80 percent, or 70 to 80 thousand passengers per day, um, especially on the on the peak days, you know, Friday and Monday, and so on and so forth. And now, what we're looking at, you know, with school holidays, the Grand Prix, Easter, and Anzac Day, we're looking at significant levels of activity that are in line with 2019, or in line or exceed 2019 levels. So international is still quite low for obvious reasons. That's going to take a bit longer to grow or, or, or to return to, to previous levels, especially with China still close to us. But fundamentally, COVID is a near-term issue. And by near-term, I mean, you know, two, five years. So short to medium-term issue. This runway is a 50-year asset. So by the time we've actually managed to deliver it at the end of this decade, the airport will be crying out for the additional infrastructure in order to process the demand that we're seeing. So I'm going to talk a bit about the benefits now, and then I'll, um, and then after that I'll cover um, some of the impacts, which obviously are of significant interest um, to, to our surrounding communities. So Melbourne Airport and Melbourne are intrinsically linked, fundamentally. The success of each depends on the other. Melbourne is soon to become Australia's largest city, I think by the end of this decade, and Melbourne Airport will shortly follow as Australia's largest airport. This runway, so the, the numbers you see on this screen for the most part represent um, activity 20 years after the runway is built. So 3,200 additional jobs on site. I think we've got about, I think in FY19, so, so in 2019 pre-COVID we had 20,000 jobs on site. And I think we would like to have 20,000 jobs on site again now if we could only find the staff. Um, perhaps speaking a little blithely there, but it is the case. Um, 37,000 additional jobs statewide by, 20, 000, by 2046. These will contribute an additional $4.6 billion per annum to gross state product. 
by 2046. And that is through all of the business and commercial and tourism activity and freight. We cannot forget freight. Freight is a vital part of our operation and freight activity that the airport will facilitate. So fundamentally, Melbourne is one of the largest export hubs for air freight in Australia. I'm not sure whether you are aware, but 90% of air freight leaves Melbourne Airport in the belly of passenger aircraft. And we really noticed this in COVID. It became a huge problem because without the passenger aircraft, we weren't getting the freight either. So it is a huge advantage to Victorian primary producers to be able to pick their produce in the morning, pack it in the afternoon and get it on the flight out that evening to whatever international market they need to be at first thing the next morning to sell it at its freshest and for the highest price. So now I'm going to talk about how the runway operates or will operate. So when we build the north-south, the second north-south runway, we will have parallel north-south operations. The east-west runway will remain in operation, but it will be used less than it is now because most of the activity will be on the parallel north-south runways. The east-west runway will be shortened to just under two kilometres long. And the reason for that is because the new north-south runway, the terrain height of the new north-south runway is higher than the east-west runway is at now. And fundamentally, it just makes more economic sense to shorten the east-west runway. Its effective capacity remains and we'll use it when the weather conditions require it. So what I'm going to talk about here are the modes of operation for the parallel north-south runways. So we have three main modes of operation and we use them depending on the um, we use them depending on the level of activity that we have. So the highest capacity mode is something called mixed mode parallel operations. That's simultaneous operations where both runways are used for arrivals and both runways are used for departures. And the direction of them is dependent on which way the wind's blowing, whether it's coming from the north or the south. Planes like to land and take off into the wind. The next mode down is the one that will be used most often throughout the day and evening when the runway opens. That is segregated parallel operation or segregated mode. That's where one runway is used for arrivals and the other runway is used for departures. And we have some options within that in how we use, you know, which runway we use for which. And we've gone out in our community consultation, what we've asked the community for is some feedback on which of those options they prefer. So one of the options provides predictable and in more intense noise to a fewer number of houses. And the other option affects more residences in totality, but provides each of them with days of respite because we will, you know, use one on one day and the other on the next day, depending on the wind as well. And then the third option, the third mode, I should say, is something called sod props, rolls off the tongue, simultaneous opposite direction, parallel runway operations. And this is a great sort of outcome, I guess, for those residents south of the airport, because this is where all operations are to the north of the airport. So arrivals coming in from the north and departures leaving to the north. Now, because the nature of this mode, the weather conditions have to be perfect for us to use it. And so that is why we can't oversell openly. We well, we have to be open about it. We can't oversell this mode. It can only be used about 25 or 30% of the time for an hour or more, during, depending on whether it's summer or winter. So this is the, the sod props mode is something that would, it would be our preferred mode to use overnight. So times when capacity or, or demand for the, for, the, for the parallel runway system is at its lowest. And so it's safest, you know, given the gaps between the flights to be able to direct and receive everything to the north. So that's how the runway operates. And here are some flight paths. Now for comparison, what we're showing here are the flight paths as they are currently for our two runway operations. What you can see on the left is what we call the purple blob. And these show actual flights in Melbourne in 2019. And as you can see, Pretty much all of Melbourne had a flight over it at some point. What this doesn't show though, is the intensity of those flights. So in other words, you know, how, you know, cause some areas will receive significantly more than others, obviously. 
So then the next two um, images you see, the one in the middle has the flight paths for arrivals and the one on the right is for departures. And the colour of the flight paths on the image reflects how dense the operation is. So it goes without saying that the closer you get, so the red means, means um, the red is the most dense in terms of operational levels. And you can see here, as you start, as you get closer to the runway, the aircraft have to be on a straight line in line with the runway centre line. And so that's why you get very little capacity to swing the flights around and move them and, and, and share the noise the closer to the runway you get. Here we have the flight paths for the proposed parallel north-south operations for mixed mode, which if you recall is the highest capacity mode. Departures in yellow, arrivals in blue, and we have the options for each end of for, for coming from the north or coming from the south, depending on which way the wind is blowing. And you can see here that um, a significant part of Melbourne, again, or will, will still be overflown. What we show right now, so right now, what we've got on public exhibition is what we call an airspace concept. It is yet to go, so we've worked with air services on this to get a concept, in other words, sort of like an envelope for approval. And this is what we go out to exhibition on. And then this, we get the envelope for approval and then that will be refined during detailed airspace design post-approval. But the reason here we're showing the flight paths as like, I guess, swooshes is what, is what we call them. So in other words, sort of blurry lines of color is to reflect the fact that it's still a concept. It hasn't been refined yet, but also importantly, to reflect the fact that aircraft don't religiously follow a flight path. So more, you know, quite often an aircraft will diverge a bit from its exact flight path because it's avoiding a particular weather condition or perhaps they're running late and they've asked air traffic control if they can have a shortcut. So there's lots of different reasons why planes might not follow their flight paths and we need to try and reflect this in the design and that's why we've got that sort of blurred swoosh that we're showing. So what you saw previously was the flight paths. Now, flight paths translate to aircraft noise, but the closer a flight is or an aircraft is to the ground, the noisier it is. Again, I mean, it's just logic. So, you know, so whilst most of Melbourne is overflown, that, you know, you might be able to see an aircraft in the sky, but that doesn't necessarily mean you'll hear it or you'll be disturbed by it. So what we also have are these things called noise contours. <clears throat> and what I've shown here on this slide is something called the end contours. There are two different ways of drawing noise contours on a map. One of them is that something called the ANEF, the Australian Noise Exposure Forecast. And that's the official um, noise contour that um, we put in the master plan and that gets turned into um, the Melbourne Airport Environs Overlay. So that gets translated into the Victorian Planning Scheme. As far as I'm concerned, the ANEF is a black box. It's very difficult to understand what an ANEF line means in terms of aircraft noise to a person on the ground. So what we also do is follow national guidelines for um, modelling and, and reporting on noise impacts and use these things called N contours, which is what you can see on the screen now. So an N stands for number above. <clears throat> so an N70 contour, which you can see here for opening year, during the day and evening. So day and evening is 6 a.m. to 11 p.m. and night here on this side is 11 p.m. to 6 a.m. So it's the number, so an N70 contour indicates the number of noise events of 70 decibels or more you will get over the time period indicated. So in this case, between 6 a.m. and 11 p.m. And obviously the closer you get to the airport, the lower the aircraft are to ground and the noisier it gets. The reason why we do 70 decibels for the day and 60 decibels per night, 70 decibels outside is 60 decibels inside. And 60 decibels is about what I'm talking at now. So that's conversation level. So a 60 decibel noise inside is something that could feasibly interrupt conversation. So that's why we model the 70 decibel for during the daytime. And then at night, it's quiet, obviously. So we do 60 decibels, we, we, we lower, we lower the, 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 the cutoff. So we do 60 decibels outside, it's 50 decibels inside. And that is the level at which sleep could be disturbed for some people. 
So we have, I've just shown two of them. We've got a lot of different noise contours. We've got noise contours over 24 hours. We've got noise contours just over the nighttime periods. And we've also got online an interactive noise tool where you can type in your address and look at the noise contours specifically for your residents, both as they are now, or 2019, last full year of activity, but also um, as they will be on the year of the opening of the third runway and 20 years after. And we also include what you've got here, which is the noise contours for the ultimate four runway operation. So going back to those early slides I showed you where we, you know, the original planners thought of this four runway that Melbourne Airport would need four runways eventually, we continue to protect and safeguard for that and then continue to um, I mean, it's a requirement that we do that, but we continue to publish the noise impacts expected to be associated with the ultimate four runway operation. I won't spend much time on it in this presentation, but the project obviously has an environmental impact and the MDP covers this in a huge amount of detail. The major development plan covers the environmental impact in a huge amount of detail. We look at PFAS, we look at the ecological impacts the project has and the offsets that we have already secured in order to proceed with the project for those impacts. We look at European cultural heritage and indigenous cultural heritage impacts and the mitigations for those impacts. And we also look at greenhouse gases and climate change. As far as the build goes, um, it's Melbourne Airport, it's, <laughs> I've decided it's deceptively flat. So it looks quite flat when you're out there, but actually there's, in terms of building this runway, there's a huge amount of dirt that we need to move around. Approximately 6 million cubic metres of, um, of fill will be required. Now, the good news is the significant majority of that can be um, sourced on site, which is great for our circular economy principles. Um, but fundamentally, that amount of dirt needing to be moved around, plus the runway, plus the additional taxiway infrastructure supporting that, it'll take four to five years to build, we think, at this stage. We haven't gone refined through detailed design process, but four to five years is what we think. There'll be approximately 650 people involved in construction activities, and just noting that construction access will be outside of the you know, front door of the airport as far as the passenger access goes, but we're really conscious of the traffic issues on Sunbury Road. I mean, most of the a significant um, portion of the, 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 the people who work at Melbourne Airport live north of the airport. So we're well aware of the issues on Sunbury Road and the construction traffic will be planned and managed to avoid peak times and avoid clogging the road as much as we possibly can. So public exhibition, which is what we're doing now, as I mentioned before, um, it runs for three and a half months. We did, at the beginning of exhibition, we did a mail out to about a million households. We've done a significant amount of advertising, radio, print, social media, and a lot of that advertising has been done. You know, we're trying to broadcast information about the project in as many, in, in seven languages to try and reach as many people as we possibly can. And we're doing online events kind of like this, and we're also doing a number of in-person events too. So that's it from me. I will stop sharing my screen. Thank you, Rose.